Assalamu alaikum and welcome students. My name is Dr. Ghulam Ahmed Farooq and this is the graduate students course for software requirements engineering. In this course we will talk about different aspects of software requirements, how they are gathered and what are the processes involved in this uh, very important aspect of software engineering life cycle. Before we talk about the processes in detail, let me just emphasize that requirements form the basis or the foundation for all software projects. If this process, if this activity is conducted firmly and correctly, then we lay the foundation which results in a very successful and high quality software product. But if this is not done correctly, then we suffer from poor quality software. And requirements engineering is the process which enables us to systematically determine the requirements of the software product. Throughout this course, we will talk about different activities in this requirements engineering process. And we will also discuss the problems and issues that we face in gathering the requirements, negotiating, and analyzing the requirements. This is a very human and very cultural oriented process and we will talk about these issues in later lectures. But before we do that, let's start off with defining what are requirements and what do we mean by software requirements. And in today's lecture, we will talk about software requirement from different perspectives and we will elaborate on these foundations in later lectures throughout the semester. The Webster Dictionary defines requirement as something wanted or something needed. Now, it is interesting to note that there is a difference between the word want and the word need. And requirement considers or both of these words are as its meaning or as synonyms. But we have to understand the differences between these two words if we want to develop high quality software products. And I'd like to talk about the differences between these two words a little bit. As most of you have studied computer science before coming to this MS program, you understand that many customers do not know what their requirements are. And as requirements engineers, it is the responsibility of the requirements engineer to understand, discover, and elaborate the exact requirements that a customer has for a particular software product. Now, it may sound very confusing, but this is a fact that many customers want something in their product. I have just mentioned that many customers don't understand the differences between wants and needs as far as requirements in their software products are concerned. I enjoy telling this as an example to my students that many kids want to eat pizza or burgers, but in reality, they may not need it. So this is the difference which exists between what is wanted versus what is needed. Now the software engineers must have professionalism and training to understand the differences between these two things and express them clearly to their customers. If they don't do that, they will be developing software products which don't meet the real needs of the customers. And that is very important for developing high quality software. Meeting the real needs, and real requirements of the customers. It is true that customers pay for the software product. But it is also true that software engineers have to live and work 
according to the Code of Ethics that has been issued by IEEE Computer Society and uh, Association of Computing Machinery for their profession. So it is very important to follow the ethical and um, business professionalism while discovering and documenting software requirements. Let's move on to more formal aspects of what software requirements are. Software requirements are a complete description of what the system does and not how it is done. So again, we are describing things in what versus how. Let's first understand what this means. When we say this software product does this as compared to how it does a certain thing, there are differences of understanding and differences of um, abstractions in these two statements. I can say my car runs on a particular, with a particular engine. I'm not describing how my car runs on a particular engine. And that's a very important part of gathering software requirements or documenting software requirements. Many people, many customers especially, and we'll see later in the examples, that they find it very convenient to describe how things work instead of telling what things should be done or what are the features of that software product. And then again, when you dis start describing how things work as compared to what things do, you, develop, you go into the mechanics of developing things which is not the intent and purpose of software requirements. So again, formally stating what software requirements describe, are they describe a complete description of what the software system will do without describing how it will do it. So again, a very important point which must be understood by all students of requirements engineering is that you need to describe what the system does as against how it does it at the requirements level. When you describe how things are done, you are entering the modeling phase, you're entering, you're entering the design phase, which is not the intent and purpose of the requirements engineering phase. So one point that I want my students to take home from this very initial uh, offering in this course is that they should understand the difference between what the system does as compared to how the system does it. And many students I've seen, and many professionals also, fall, in, fall into this uh, trap of describing how products are developed at the requirements level when they should be focusing on what are the features, what are the functionalities of that software product. And I continuously educate my students as well as my coworkers that we need to stay at the what level as compared to the how level of requirements. Let's look at another point. One way of looking at software requirements, it describes the complete specification of the desired external behavior of the software system to be built. It describes a complete specification of the desired external behavior of the software system to be built. Now we are getting a little bit technical in our discussion here. Let's talk about what the specification is or what complete specification means. Complete specification means what the system does and it also means that specification, a product can be viewed by its users from different perspectives. So the requirement should describe all the possible aspects of software product 
from different perspectives. But one important phrase that, we, that I've used in this discussion is the term external behavior. The desired external behavior of the software system has to be captured, has to be documented, and it has to be understood by its users. The important, and the reason I said that it's a very important phrase, is that the users can only understand a product from its external behavior. They don't know how the product is built, they don't care how the product is built, and they should not know how the product is built. They can only use and judge the product by its external behavior. By external behavior, we mean that if we give it an input, how does it respond? Does it respond in the way you expect it, or it responds in the way which is erroneous? Does it behave, does it produce correct results, or it produces incorrect results? That's the external behavior. If I start my car, and it refuses to do so, then I don't know what is the problem. But as far as I'm concerned, the car is not working. It's not functional. Its external behavior is erroneous. So is the case with software product. If I want to calculate something, let's say salaries for all the departments uh, in my company, and the software is not producing the right results, then it is erroneous. And how do I know that? I know by its external behavior. So the software requirements must capture the external behavior of the software product that one wants to build. And that is the second point that I want my students to take home today. Now let's look at the abstract level details of what software requirements may be. A software requirement may be abstract statements and services and or constraints and they may be detailed mathematical functions or formulas or some other domains. But the thing is that you can describe requirements at multiple levels, at multiple levels of uh, abstraction. They can be simple statements. I can say, I want a software product which calculates payroll for all employees. On the other hand, I can calculate, I can say that this is a formula develop a software product to, to uh, calculate the scientific uh, formula or scientific application. So the levels of details can be from a very high level to a very low level. And that is also uh, must be understood by students and professionals so that document the requirements correctly. Another thing that should be understood about requirements is that they may be included in the contract that is the business contract. Although it is not recommended, but they may be included as part of the contract. They may be included in bidding for a contract and they may also become part of the technical document that uh, is written when a contract is signed. So again, the requirements can be operating at different levels of abstraction. Let's say, let's take an example from the construction industry. I can go to an architect and say, I want a house built, okay? And I want a detailed map of the house. I can say, I want three bedrooms and so forth. But I also can say, it is up to you, I want 400 square yard house and bring me a map it's all up to you and we'll discuss the details when uh, when you come up with the document but on the other hand i can provide more details about the views about the side views the front views about the elevation and so forth and all of these would still fall into the requirements for a customer the same is applied to software products but with a little bit more emphasis that software products cannot be viewed, touched, or, or destroyed like physical products. 
So more care has to be taken in developing, in understanding, de negotiating, and analyzing software requirements. Let's talk about what IEEE has to say about it. A condition or a capability that must be met or possessed by a system to satisfy a contract, standard, specification, or other formally imposed document. Let's review this in detail. A condition, which can be a constraint, a capability is a functionality that must be met or possessed by a software system to satisfy a contract, as we have talked about as requirements being part of the contract, as a standard, and there are a lot of IT standards and other standards being discussed these days. Specification, we have talked about what specifications are. Specifications capture the external behavior of software products or other formally imposed documents. So what IEEE, which is the flagship organization for electronics and computer professionals, has formally come out with the definition for requirement. Let's look at which sources requirements are gathered. Primarily, requirements are gathered from stakeholders. Now, what are stakeholders? Stakeholders are people affected in some way or the other by the system that are being developed, who are developing the system or who have an interest in an existing system or a proposed system. Let's say if we are developing a payroll software, the people who are interested are affected in this are the employees, the accounts department, and the finance department. There may be tax liabilities, so the government tax reg regulatory departments may also be involved. So stakeholders are people affected in one way or the other by the new system and also people who are using the old system. So this is one source of requirement. Another very important source is documents. I just mentioned that if you're developing software for payroll deductions and calculations, tax laws and company laws would be a very important source for those requirements. The tax calculations uh, and the tax regulations vary from time to time and they are documented and provided by the government. And they are, they are not part of the company's uh, policies. They're basically part of the documents which are imposed by the government. Another important source for requirements is the existing system, the manual system or an outdated computer system. That tells you how things operate uh, in the company or in an organization. And lastly, the area from where we can capture requirements is the business area or the domain. Let's say we are developing software for, again, from payroll systems, then there are issues, let's say the provident fund, the pension funds, these are the things that are included in the business area or the application domain. So every software requirements engineer must collaborate and gather requirements from these four sources. If you skip one of them, then you are not going to fully understand the impact of requirements that you are going to develop or you are going to collect. So again, summarizing the four key points, from the sources from where you can gather requirements is number one, the stakeholders, number two, the documents, number three, the existing system, and number four, the domain or business area. I had earlier mentioned about the levels of software requirements. And I also said that the stakeholders can define the requirements in different levels. They can be described in a very detailed level or they can be described in a very high level instead of giving more details. One can view them as one person's floor as another person's ceiling. Or more subtly, you can say that this is a what versus how dilemma. In the beginning of the lecture, I had mentioned that software requirements should capture 
what system should do as compared to how system is developed or how system works. But the fact of the matter is that many people find it convenient to describe how things work as compared to what should be done. This is the classical what versus how dilemma. There are user needs which are described at the level and if you provide more details at that level, you can go into the how level as compared to the what level. Looking at this slide, you can see that every level on the left side, user needs, product space, actual product behavior, architecture data flow, module specifications, algorithms and code have two sub-levels. One is what, the other is how. The what of one level can be the how of the other level. And that is the typical dilemma that our customers or most software customers feel when they are describing their requirements and needs. And one has to understand that their understanding, their vision about the product is different and the level of understanding is also different. The way professionals, computer professionals understand one thing is very different from how computer users understand this thing and how developers understand this thing. So although it is very much appreciated that customers describe what should be done, but one as a professional should give them a benefit of not understanding the computer terminology that if even if they describe things in how things, you know, in the mechanism wise, they should be given leeway and the professionals should themselves place them or words or document them in such a way that they capture the specification or external behavior of the software product. Another important point that I would like to mention here is that what describes the policy matters, the functionality aspects, as compared to how, which is the mechanisms. To develop mechanisms for software products is the responsibility of software designers and developers. It is not the responsibility of software requirements engineers. If requirements engineers describe how things should be developed or how software product should be developed, then they are encroaching in the domain and responsibilities of software designers who are better equipped and more trained to do their job as compared to requirements engineers. So again, describing our thoughts on what should be included in requirements, they should be included what the system does as compared to how it is done, and but it should also include different perspectives of uh, different stakeholders in that software product. For example, software product is used by developers, it is used by testers, it is used by customers, and it is used by requirements engineers and it is also used by maintainers. It may also be used by competitors. So there are multiple stakeholders involved and requirements engineers must include all the requirements from different perspectives. At this point, I would like to mention a very important quote. Senior researcher in software engineering had described. He says the single hardest part of building a software system is deciding what to build. No other part of the work so cripples the resulting system if done wrong. No other part is difficult to rectify later. So this slide tells you the importance of software requirements. This is again, as I had said in the beginning of the lecture, is the foundation of the software product. If this is done correctly, then the product will be developed using high quality standards.
But if the requirements are not gathered correctly, not documented correctly, then there will be problems, certainly problems, later on during the software life cycle. Let's look at some of the examples of software requirements. The system shall maintain records of all payments made, made to employees on accounts of salaries, bonuses, travel, daily allowances, medical allowances, etc. Look at different things that are covered in this requirement. It includes salaries, bonuses, travel and daily allowances, medical allowances, etc. Does not though mention the taxes and other things. And again, this is at a high level of abstraction. It covers many things, provides little information on how things are calculated, focuses more on what has to be done. Looking at the next example, it says the system shall interface with the central computer to send daily sales and inventory data from every retail store. Again, this requirement does not describe how the computers at the retail store will interface with the central computer. Just says that this should be done and does not say how things should be done. So this is again an example of a well-documented requirement. Let's look at another requirement. This is from the library system. The system shall maintain records of all library materials, including books, serials, newspapers and magazines, video and audio tapes, reports, collections of transparencies, CD-ROMs and DVDs, etc. This requirement tells us that a library system may consist of any number of these things that I've mentioned. It does not tell us how the, this record should be kept, what other information is needs to be captured, although the, those things may be documented elsewhere, but how things are done is not part of this requirement. And again, this may be a long requirement in itself, but this is a well-documented requirement. Looking at another example, the system shall allow users to search for an item by title, author, or by international standard book number or ISBN. This requirements again is from the library system. Now you can, this requirement tells you to enable the software so that you can do searches on using different parameters. Those can be title of the book, author's name, or by ISBN number. Again, does not tell you how the searches should be done, how they should be calculated, or how, how much time should it take for the search to complete. Another requirement from the library system is that the system's user interface shall be implemented using a web browser so that students and library users can uh, search the library from their homes, from their offices, from their classrooms, from their labs. They don't have to physically go to the library to search for a book or a CD or a DVD or other things. Again, does not tell you how this protocol or how this search mechanism should be implemented. This tells you what are the requirements as compared to how things should be implemented. Let's look at another requirement. The system should support at least 20 transactions per second. This requirement captures the performance or efficiency of the system. It does not tell you to use a particular hardware or a particular technology, but it says that the users of the system would want a response so that in one second, at least 20 transactions can be completed. And another requirement is that the system facilities which are available to public users should be demonstrable in 10 minutes or less. Again, this is a requirement which deals with the timing or efficiency of the, or the response time and the efficiency of the software product. These are valid software requirements. They don't provide you the mechanisms of, or the constraints which force your design, but they enable the developers to come up with 
niche software designs so that these requirements can be met by the software product. Let's look at the kinds of requirements that software, that these requirements can be broken down into. There are five kinds of software requirements. Number one, the functional requirements. Number two, non-functional requirements. Number three, domain requirements. Number four, inverse requirements. And number five, design and implementation constraints. In this lecture, we will concentrate only on the first of these five, that is the functional requirements, and we will see what are included in functional requirements, what is not included in functional requirements. As the name suggests, functional requirements are statements describing what the system does. In other words, they capture the functionality of the system. So they can be sort of the fundamental part of the software product as far as requirements are concerned. Functional requirements form the backbone of the software requirements. They capture what the system does and the, it depends on the complexity of the software system which determines how many requirements exist in the requirements document. For example, very complex softwares can have thousands of requirements as compared to very simple software products which can have less than 10 requirements. But functional requirements are the core of on the basis of which a software product is built. These are statements describing what the system does. Remember in the beginning of this lecture, I talked about the external behavior as the statements, as the specification which are, which describe the external behavior of the software product. Functional requirements are the statements and services the system should provide in two clearly described external behaviors. Number one, reaction to particular inputs. So if I give input, one input to my software product, it produces a result. That is reaction to a particular input. And the other is behavior in particular situations. For example, if I click on close button or exit button, the system behaves in a particular fashion. So these are the two visible external behaviors of a software product. And both of these must be captured in functional requirements. So functional requirements, again, restating the same thing because functional requirements capture the core of the software product, capture the reaction to particular inputs, and behavior in particular situations. And depending upon the domain for which we are developing software, we may have to document sequencing and parallelism in our domain. For example, if we are dealing with concurrent and real-time systems, there is sequencing and parallelism issues that must be addressed by the software product. So sequencing and parallelism are an important part of certain domains. And as mentioned by me a little bit earlier, that uh, particularly in concurrent and real-time systems, these are the key issues affecting software products. So again, these requirements must be documented in the software product. Another important part of functional requirements is capturing the exception handling or abnormal behavior in certain situations. As it is well understood that in almost every case there is an abnormal behavior associated with it. And that is sometimes missed even by customers and by requirements engineers. So functional requirements must also include the exception handling of abnormal behaviors. So functional requirements, recapturing what I had said earlier, includes statements 
which comprise of the functionality of the system. They also include sequencing and parallelism aspects of the domains and they also capture the abnormal behavior in certain situations so that proper exception handling can be taken care of. Let's move on to the next aspect of the functional requirements. A very important aspect of functional requirements is that they should be complete and consistent and that is why customers and developers usually focus all their attention on documenting functional requirements. Now this is a very difficult area to completely and consistently specify or document requirements. It is easy for, for small, relatively small projects to document requirements completely. But for very large and complex systems, it is very, very difficult to document, to document requirements completely and consistently because information is coming from multiple sources, multiple stakeholders are involved, and in some cases, these requirements run into thousands and thousands of numbers. So it is not really possible for requirements engineers to completely specify requirements in complex systems. And this is a challenge for them. And we will talk about this challenge later in the semester. Uh, and I will leave uh, with the current thought, that is, if the requirements should be documented as completely as possible and as consistently as possible. Now let's look at some of the examples of functional software requirements. This is example number one which says that the system shall solve a quadratic equation using the following formula. The formula is given. It's a very detailed requirement, but it is a very simple requirement also because the formula is very simple. There is no complication in it, but if we'll talk about some of the problems with this requirement a little later uh, in the lecture today. So looking at the requirement for calculating quadratic equation is one way of documenting requirements. The second example is, and I read, this user shall be able to search either the entire database of patients or select a subset from it which can be subset of admitted patients or subset of patients with asthma or patients with other diseases. This requirement is coming from a hospital information system Again, telling you what the functionality of the product is, not describing how search should be implemented, and it captures and it is documented as a function requirement. So it has multiple options within this requirement. You can either search a complete database or you can search for subset of databases. Let's look at the third example. The system shall provide appropriate viewers for the user to read documents in the document store. Look at the level of detail of this requirement. This requirement has been described at a very high level as compared to the two examples that we have seen before. And uh, the level of detail in the first two examples was much more than in this example. Let's look at the fourth example of function requirements. It says every order shall be allocated a unique identifier, which can be order ID, which the user shall be able to copy to the account's permanent storage area. Now this is a functional requirement which says that all the products should have a unique ID and user should be able to access that product to that order ID. So this requirement tells us that the user shall be able to use the user ID for accessing that particular transaction. Now let's look at 
another example it says the system shall allow customers to return non-perishable items within 15 days of the purchase a customer must present the original sale receipt to return an item this example again is coming from a retail software which is used to sell products and is also used to return products but it has a very specific task for returning non-perishable items non-perishable items are those which are not like food items which do not perish within the 15 days or so but it also lays a very important constraint on the customer which is to bring the original sale receipt so that the original sale can be confirmed and if that transaction was made on a subsidized basis the actual amount of the item can be given back to the customer now let me make some of the comments on these examples number one notice the level of detail in different requirements described above remember the requirement about quadratic equation which was a detailed mathematical functionality of detailed mathematical equation let's look at it from another perspective it gives you the detailed formula for calculating the value of uh, the quadratic equation but what it does not mention is the possibility when the value of variable a is zero what should the system do in case the value of a is zero you, you can see that if the value of a is zero then this would be a divide by the computer will give you a divide by zero error but that's not a desired functionality of the software product when you have a situation like this the software should degrade gracefully but also notice that there is an ambiguity in the requirement which simply states that following is the formula for calculating quadratic equation and the developers are required to just solve that or implement that equation so in case a is zero it is up to the developers to think for graceful degradation of the system there are two possibilities one which is very simple and mundane is that the software product simply refuses to solve the quadratic equation and says that this is an error and the user is expected to give proper input or the other is that the product should ask from the user whether he or she wants a solution for a linear equation but in that case the requirement will considerably change and the results will not be that of a quadratic equation but that of a linear equation from that perspective although the requirement was clearly stated it was ambiguous from another perspective so at the end of this lecture let's just review a couple of things number one it is important to document the requirements in consistently and completeness as much as possible because if one does not do that they are open to multiple interpretations which can result in the development of faulty software one does not want faulty software let's just recap today's lecture requirements form the basis of all software engineering projects functional requirements capture the behavioral aspects and functions of the proposed automated system and functional requirements are the backbone of all software products these three points tell you the crux or the summary of today's lecture in the next lecture we will talk about other kinds of software requirements see you next time thank you very much